Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, I think I was on mute. I apologize. Um, I'm Comer Yates, and I'm the executive director of the Atlanta Speech School. Um, we're an 83-year-old school, and on behalf of here in Atlanta, uh, on behalf of our staff, our children, uh, our families, we're so glad that you can join us. And I'm also um, speaking on behalf of the 163,000 members of our free online Cox campus, members in 62 countries in all 50 states. Um, and we're all joined around one purpose, um, uh, the pursuit of social justice, long overdue and equity, um, where every child has the right to decide their own futures um, and to make the greatest difference possible in the lives of others. So for us uh, at the speech school, it's all about every child having a voice. Uh, and I can't imagine a better opportunity or group or event um, by which we can try to achieve that purpose than tonight's gathering. Uh, we're so appreciative that uh, Greg Bear uh, is here um, uh, and um, uh, with Ryan, um, uh, Ryan, I'm going to mispronounce your last name. Rizeski, I feel the responsibility to get it right. Uh, Ryan Rizeski is here as well in their book, When You Wonder, You're Learning About uh, Fred Rogers. And um, particularly grateful that this evening is going to be framed and, and introduced by Ralph Smith, who is the managing director of the campaign for grade level reading. Uh, we couldn't have a better person um, to, to create this framework than Ralph because of his leadership. Um, and more specifically with respect to Fred Rogers, um, he gave the, um, the keynote speech at the opening of the Fred Rogers Center back in 2003 and has been the recipient of the Fred Rogers Award. Uh, recognizing his service. Um, there's another reason why um, Ralph is, is the perfect person um, at this moment. And I'm so proud to introduce him. Um, years ago, I was at, a, at an event where Ralph was being honored and um, he spoke of illiteracy and he was spoken, speaking to a group of, of people who were supporting uh, women in prison who had been separated from their children and what could be done to, to maintain their agency and relationship with their children. And as part of the talk, um, Ralph said um, that illiteracy is a, a crisis against which we must rebel. And I guess tonight, Ryan and Greg, we might be talking tonight about the original rebel um, relative to our rights for, for children, somebody who just found who we were um, and what we were doing for our children just to be intolerable in some ways. And um, Ralph has, has been my North Star um, since that time. And, um, and for me, when I think about Ralph's work and Fred Rogers' call for, for higher ground, I, I think about what he said in terms of our seeking. Um, he talked about trying to seek um, holy ground with children in his work with them. And I think here in the summer of 2021, as we approach the next school year, never have we needed to find holy ground for our children um, more than in this moment. Um, and so Greg and Ryan and Ralph, um, we are so, so appreciative that you could be with us tonight. And Ryan, my colleague, who's the director of our Rollins Center for Language and Literacy, really grateful for your moderating this work. So. Ralph, um, if I can turn over the evening with, to, with you to gratitude, with great gratitude, I'm, I'm really privileged to do that. Well, well, thank you. Thank you so much. I am honored uh, to have an opportunity to play a role tonight. My major responsibility, <clears throat> I will dispatch at the very beginning. My major responsibility is to introduce tonight's moderator, uh, Dr. Ryan Lee James, director of the Rollins Center for Language and Literacy 
at the Atlanta Speech School. Now, I will tell you that I have seen Ryan as a moderator, and I am looking forward to tonight's conversation. So I'm going to, Ryan, I'm going to try to be brief, get out of your way, and sit back and watch this conversation uh, with two Ryans and one Greg. Let me uh, say that you know, for many of us who live outside the state of Georgia, Stacy Adams has come to symbolize the very best of what Georgia represents. I count myself among her legion of admirers. And that is why I'm so pleased at the top of the, this program to share a quote from her her review of this remarkable work we're gonna to discuss tonight. Here's what Stacy said. In an era of polarization, distrust and despair, the resilience of children stand as a universal beacon of hope, hope for a new and better society. <clears throat> Fred Rogers understood our obligation to nourish that spark of imagination, kindness, and community. Speaking of the book that brings us here tonight, Tom Hanks notes that what Greg and Ryan have done is bring Fred Rogers' essential humanity down to earth. Todd Rose goes on to describe when you wonder your learning as a compelling, beautifully written call for seeing, supporting, and loving the individual complexities of every human being, whether they're kids or adults, our own children or our neighbors. This remarkable book by Greg and Ryan allows us all to see with clarity how science provides powerful and irrefutable evidence of what Fred Rogers understood about the talismanic, transformative, and enduring value of authenticity, empathy, and grace. And as I turn the evening over to Dr. Ryan uh, Lee James, I wanna channel for a moment, Joanne Rogers, a wonderful and remarkable woman in her own right. I want, she passed away earlier this year and those of us who had the pleasure of knowing her over the past decade plus, found in her not only an ardent advocate for the life and the work and relevance of the late Fred Rogers, but we found in her a depth of decency that compelled all around her to listen, to learn, and to embrace the values she continued to represent. And I was delighted uh, that she had the opportunity uh, to write the foreword for this book. And so I want to say, as she said, well, Fred, it gives me a good feeling to know that you're with us now. In those old sweaters of yours and in the six chapters of this beautiful book. Ryan. Thank you, Ralph. Oh, I'm so excited to be with you guys this evening. Um, so I just want to really start out by allowing our um, our special guests, our authors this afternoon and, and this evening. And Ryan, I'm not going to butcher your last name, Rizeski. Mm -hmm. I think I got it. Um, and Greg. Um, I've so so many times. <laughs> <laughs> so if you guys would. Just start by telling us a little bit about who you are, what you do, 
and why you decided to write this book. So it, thank you, Dr. Lee James and, and Dr. Smith and Comer. We're so grateful to be here. And what you need to know about us first and foremost is that we're kids of Western Pennsylvania. And that's important because Fred Rogers too was a child of Western Pennsylvania and filmed his iconic television show, Mr. Rogers Neighborhood, right at WQED, which is America's first public television station located here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So we start first and foremost as Western Pennsylvania kids. I'm a dad, Ryan is a former teacher. We both had the privilege of working on behalf of the Grable Foundation, which is a private charitable foundation invested in the well being of children and youth, families, and educators here in southwestern Pennsylvania, and young people who, for economic reasons, don't have the same opportunities as their peers. Like Dr. Smith, I started my professional career as a lawyer and um, quickly found the light of being deeply invested in civil society and the nonprofit sector and really called to public service, but public service through America's civil society. And so for the past two decades have worked um, both in the nonprofit sector and in support of the nonprofit sector. And for the past 15 years of the Grable Foundation, ideally as an ally to educators in and out of school from early childhood through higher education. Ryan? Yeah, so I just wanna first echo Greg's gratitude to Comer and Ralph and Ryan. Thank you so much for having us. And that introduction is just amazing. Um, like Greg said, I am a former teacher. I uh, taught closer to you in Atlanta than I am now. I was down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana for several years. Um, and when I was training to be a teacher, it was very, the way I was told to teach was very rote. It was, if you write out the steps to say a math problem and you explain it in a clear enough way and you do it enough times, kids are gonna get it. And then you can move on to the next standard and the next standard and the next standard. My first day in the classroom disabused me of that method almost immediately. Uh, I had to learn on the job. And when I finally left the classroom, I was interested in what we're learning about how human beings learn. So when I started working with Greg at the Grable Foundation a few years later, we started looking into the learning sciences. Um, and what surprised us when we talked to some of the top researchers, when we read some of the latest research papers, was that scientists, when they talk about learning, are not talking in terms that to me sounded very scientific. They're talking not in terms of data or measurement or charts or graphs, they're talking about making sure kids feel safe. They're talking about making sure kids feel welcome, making sure kids feel that they belong. They're talking about making sure kids feel loved and capable of loving. And I think when we realized that scientists sound less like scientists and more like Fred Rogers, we, we realized there was something to this idea of uh, uncovering the science behind Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Thank you for thank you for sharing that. Um, what I what I heard you say, Greg, is really that um, one of the reasons that you that you all really took this on is because Mr. Rogers is sort of in your blood and sort of in your DNA, <laughs> which is really cool. Um, and I'm thinking about just so Ryan, hearing what you're saying about digging deeper in the learning sciences. I, I certainly want to go there tonight because I know that both of you are former educators and I can't wait to dig in there. But I want to start with, um, with another question. So we often recognize the timelessness of Fred Rogers' work and the wisdom. But what about this particular work was innovative? Um, what makes this writing revolutionary? Well, you mentioned the work here in, in Western Pennsylvania, and you mentioned that Fred Rogers is part of our DNA. And in fact, at the confluence of the Allegheny, Monongahela, and Ohio rivers that form the point of downtown Pittsburgh, there is a memorial and a statue to Fred Rogers. And it's a reminder to all of us to put kids first. And as Comer referenced earlier, there was a radical element to Fred Rogers. I want to share with you too, there's a narrative about Fred Rogers and education in our region because it's in the DNA of educators themselves. And that is that there was, there's a bit of a Fred method 
right? We all remember Fred Rogers as that loving, caring individual, that guy in the cardigan who made us feel good, made us feel warm. And there very much is that aspect of Fred Rogers. And that aspect of Fred Rogers who is deeply invested in child development theory and practice. But there's also the radical, innovative, creative Fred Rogers who recognized what was attractive to kids of his day, the technology of television, and said, how do I make what's attractive to young people good and constructive? And I mentioned that to say that there are all sorts of educators, educators right in your own school and your network, educators right here across Southwestern Pennsylvania, who are connecting child development, whole child development theory and practice with what is innovative and creative and cutting edge. And they might be using technology enhanced learning, they might be using robots, they might be using tried and, and tested methods, but it's that revolution of simply connecting whole child with learning science that is so needed in this world today. And it's those blueprints of the Fred method that we believe are simultaneously timeless and revolutionary that we need in our schools, early learning centers and sites of learning for kids everywhere across America and across this globe. I, yeah, and I would just add that, um, you know, Fred, when he first encountered television, famously, he was horrified. He hated what he saw. I think the first scene he saw was uh, people throwing pies in each other's faces. And he hated to see human beings demeaning one another like that. But rather than, you know, running away from it or shunning the technology, he recognized its power. And he, like Greg said, had to figure out how do we make this attractive and good? And I think what made him so revolutionary was the level of intention that he put behind everything he did when he was standing in front of a child, even if it was through a screen. You can pick any scene from more than 900 episodes of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And if you understand the science behind it, you can pick out exactly what he was doing in any given moment. He was constantly thinking about, how am I going to make my audience feel safe? How am I going to make my audience feel connected to me? How am I going to help my audience see their own potential and follow their interests in ways that are authentic to them. I think the, you could, if you boil down Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood to any one message, it was, I like you just the way you are. And if you think about that, that is a revolutionary statement in its own right. Because he didn't just say it to the people we think are good. He said it to everybody. He saw the best in kids and he believed in the best for kids. And he did everything in his power to give the best for kids. Thank you for that. Yeah, that is a revolutionary statement. Um, I like you just the way you are. It's certainly not something that we have enough of um, in our schools, but we also don't have enough of it just thinking about in our communities, um, which we certainly, which we need more of. Um, I, I have a question just to piggyback, Greg, on something that you said, though, about, I, I think about Mr. Rogers and how I grew up with Mr. Rogers. And certainly the Mr. Rogers that I know was friendly and loving, had a really nice, soft, melodic voice um, that you could sort of feel soothed um, by listening to. But was it, was there anything that, um, that surprised you about Mr. Rogers in the research that you had to do, the extensive research you had to do to write this book? So many things. So we can speak to the intent and, and deliberateness of his work to which Ryan spoke, but um, Ryan, thinking of what you just shared about your childhood, that was my experience, right? I just, I remember the joy of watching that show. I remember sitting alongside my brother or, or, and or my mom and going to crayon factories and you know exploring the world, feeding the fish. It, it just, it was a pleasant, joyful, creative, wondrous time. As an adult, going back and looking at what Fred Rogers did, he did some extraordinary things. One of which was bringing the entirety of the world into the neighborhood, right? He did not shy away from war. He did not shy away from assassination. He did not shy away from divorce or racism or all sorts of other issues. And it, it's sort of extraordinary to me as an adult to look back and see what he did and how he brought really hard subjects that we as grown-ups have a horrible time addressing and brought them into the neighborhood for kids because kids have big feelings and big thoughts and big wonderings about these things. And he made 
what was mentionable, manageable. And um, I think it's extraordinary that he brought that into the neighborhood in, in a way. And if you'll forgive me, I'm gonna, um, there's, Ryan does this better than I do, but there's um, uh, an actress who performed on The Neighborhood and about these hard subjects, she said this, that violence and war, hatred and tolerance uh, she essentially says these things are brought into the neighborhood, but violence and war, hatred and intolerance are not painted out of the picture, but neither are they allowed to destroy the canvas. And he brought them in, helped kids think about hard things, but didn't allow to destroy uh, a sense of being and belonging and joyfulness about possibilities and solutions. Ryan, I saw you come off mute. Were you going to add to that? I was going to read that exact quote. I mean, I just think it's, it's remarkable that, you know, for a place that spent so much time in what he called the neighborhood of make-believe, I think we tend to forget how real the neighborhood was in, in so many ways. Um, that fades over time. But like Greg said, um, going back and watching it as an adult, and especially going back and watching it as an adult, in the year 2020 and the year 2021, when there are so many parallels to what was happening as he launched the neighborhood. Um, it was a profoundly moving and instructive experience for both of us. Wow. Yeah, I think um, I was actually, I actually had a question about that exactly that I was gonna ask a little bit later around those hard topics and those hard um, conversations. I'm wondering how you feel, what you feel about the relevance of that, where, considering where we are right now. So thinking about not only have kids been at home with their families for the last you know, 14 months out of school, but there's been some, some certainly some trauma that has come along with that. And so what, how do you feel, how is, how is what Mr. Rogers did then really relevant now for teachers, but also for, for families. Ryan, do you want to take this one first or do you want me to go? Go ahead. So um, I, that's the remarkable thing, right? We are all struggling to bring our kids through this time. It's a hard time, but there are always hard times, whether it's for families or for communities and I think that's partly what's been so uplifting and maybe even surprising about this book is, is that 50 years ago, someone created blueprints, Fred Rogers, that are so incredibly relevant to us today. And we frame our book in six chapters and they're themed about things like curiosity, creativity, the types of skills and mindsets that all of us here so often are so needed in our schools ought to be the focus of training and support for young people. And what Fred Rogers blueprints remind us is that yes, those things are important, but before we even get to being creative, being curious, we have to feel safe. We have to feel physically and psychologically safe. We have to know that we belong. We have to know that our questions, however crazy those questions are, that they're gonna be respected. And we have to know that we're loved and capable of loving. And today we would talk about this in the context of social emotional learning. Mm -hmm. Certainly not a phrase that was used you know, 50, 40 years ago, but it's a reminder of that importance of grounding our work, whether we're a classroom teacher, a mom and dad at home, a grandparent, a librarian, an early childhood educator. The importance of creating an environment where then kids can ultimately pursue agency and pursue their voice and pursue their passions and interests. It's incumbent upon us as grownups to create that environment that allows those skills and mindsets to flourish. And um, you think about these times, what more do we need to do than just that? I also think that there is a tendency and it's very understandable to think of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood almost as a hiding place. You know, we remember it as a place of comfort. We remember it as a place of maybe respite from the real world. Um, but I think what makes the program especially relevant now is that Rogers never waved away injustice. He never waved away hard things under the guise of being nice. 
Um, there's a woman we talked to in the book named Dr. Aisha White, and she leads, uh, it's called the Positive Racial Identity Development and Early Education Program, or PRIDE, at the University of Pittsburgh. And she, she's talking in this part of the book about, you know, how do we talk to kids about race, especially how do we talk to kids when they've harmed someone or when they've been harmed? And she says, I think we can, and she's talking about race here, but I think you can apply this to several topics. She says, I think we can help kids think about race in terms of fairness and respect. We can help them understand what it means to be human and to show humanity towards someone. We can show them, in other words, what kindness and caring really mean, rather than deploying those words to duck a hard conversation. And I think it, um, my favorite aspect of Rogers in 2021 is that, yes, there is kindness, but yes, but we're not using kindness to avoid the really hard and difficult things that are happening in the world and that are impacting kids, often in negative ways. Yeah, that's really important. You know, the, the point about not trying to explain it away, um, because <clears throat> I mean, last year, 2020 was a really hard year, I think, with as race relations in the country were really bubbling up around police brutality and just other really difficult conversations that families were having to have with their children, that teachers may have been in a position to have with their students. Um, I'm glad that we're sort of talking about the social emotional component because I want to ask a few questions that I know are really going to be of interest to our audience that for the most part are educators, but also some families. Um, Greg, you, you just talked about like the six chapters, how the book is organized around really major topics like communication. Uh, chapter five, I think was probably my favorite about failing, falling, learning, growing. Um, so I want to just dig a little deeper onto some of those topics. So having this conversation with you guys is, is really, really timely. Um, can you tell us about, so Comer sort of touched on it a little bit regarding the science and I'm sitting here at the Atlanta Speech School, just a few doors down from Comer. And really that is what the Atlanta Speech School is, is really grounded in, focused on, is applying the science. Um, so that every child in our building, in our four schools and in our clinic, but also every child through our Cox campus has access to that. So can you tell us a little bit more about the science behind Fred Rogers' neighborhood and, and, how, and how does that science apply to learning? Yeah, so there is, first we begin with a person in Fred Rogers who was remarkably deliberate about his work and deliberate about the his scripts, deliberate about the music, deliberate about every single part of the program. Everything was intentional. And it's um, important also to understand the context in which Fred Rogers was working. He was here in Pittsburgh at a time when there were some giants of child development theory, either at the University of Pittsburgh or working in our community. People like Eric Erickson, Benjamin Spock, Margaret McFarland, I mean, this is a pantheon of, of child development theory um, uh, and practitioners. And, and he was learning from them and finding ways to apply what he was learning from them in the scripts and the delivery of his program. And think about the experience for those of us who had the privilege of watching the show or maybe watching it with our kids. Think about just the very opening scenes, right? There's a frenetic energy, jazz music, brings us in. It's like the world bringing us in. There's a speed, there's an energy, but he slows us down, right? And there's a deliberateness of, of taking time to take off his coat, put on the sweater, change his shoes, sit down and, and, and pause us and slow us down. So from the music to the motion, to even the color of blue on the walls, right? Everything was deliberate in a sense of environment drives behavior of creating an environment that it's time to slow down, it's okay to pause, you're in a place that you're safe, you're in a place where you're loved, you're in a place where you have great big questions, and you know what, today we're gonna to go and explore those questions. But then we're gonna come back and talk about those questions. And Fred Rogers was decades ahead of, of, of all of us, right? I mean, he, he literally was practicing the learn, learning sciences before the phrase learning sciences was even a, a phrase in our terminology. And what we try and do in the book is elucidate really decades of learning science 
in the context of what it is that Fred Rogers did in his show in such a familiar way to each of us. Just to illustrate, you know, one aspect of what Greg mentioned, he was so far ahead of his time. The title of our book is When You Wonder, You're Learning. That is a line that comes from um, one of the songs that Rogers used to sing. And it's sort of like a pleasant phrase, but Rod what Rogers realized was that when kids are curious about something, they are more likely to retain information about it. And that was sort of a hunch that he had that he developed from working with Margaret McFarlane and Eric Erickson and the others Greg mentioned. Many, many, many years later, uh, scientists did a study by scanning participants' brains where they, they watched their brains light up as they were shown different um, topics. And the more curious participants were about a given topic, of course, the more likely they were to remember information about that topic. But what's really interesting is they were more likely to learn about topics they were interested in, but when their brains were in a state of curiosity, they were also more likely to learn about everything else that was in their environment. One of the researchers called it or said, your brain when it's curious is like a vortex. It just sucks everything in. When you think about that, Roger's line, when you wonder you're learning can be taken very literally. When you're curious, that's all it takes. When you're curious, you are learning. When you're wonder, you're learning. And there are so many examples like that um, throughout the book where Rogers says or does something in 1968 or 1975 or 1981. And often the science that proves he was correct is coming out in 2010 or 2020, years, sometimes even decades after his death. Thank you, Ryan. Certainly, uh, Mr. Rogers was ahead of his time. I wanna ask you guys a question about chapter five, which happened to be a, a really great chapter for me to read um, because I think for the work that we do at the speech school and at the Rollins Center, chapter five was is just really central to that. The chapter about failure and falling and learning and growing. So I'm just gonna read a little bit because I wanna get this right. You guys write in that chapter, um, and I think it was a quote from Fred Rogers, that life is more about striving than attaining. And then you pose several questions after that. What is it that allows a child to thrive towards a goal of their choosing? What drives the kid to keep growing and learning even when it's difficult? And how do they develop the trust and confidence they need to persevere? Or when necessary to take risks and or pivot? So my question to you guys is what answers, so we talked about the blueprint, what answers did Fred Rogers leave to answer that, to help us answer those questions? Ryan, do you wanna start this one? Sure, so what is it that allows a child to strive to function toward a goal of his or her choosing? It sounds, this is one of those things that sounds unscientific, but in this case, it really comes down to relationships. Yep. Um, you know, after that passage, we give an example of, uh, it happens in the neighborhood of make-believe and there's a puppet named H.J. Elephant and he's about to do this big magic trick where he chants something and the wind comes and whisks him away and then he reappears. He calls it his boomerang trick. And this is really scary to some of the pupils in his class. And one of them raises her hand, her name is Anna Platypus. And she says, can you not do that? Like, I'm actually, I'm scared. I don't wanna see that. Her body actually starts to, she starts to shut down. She's not able to learn. Rogers beautifully has Anna Platypus's um, classmates offer to support her. One offers to hold her hand. Another offers to hold her hand. They sort of surround her with this belonging and love and sense of we're going to do this together. Once they do that, she's able to sit through the lesson and she loves it. She's able to experience it fully because she feels physically and psychologically safe. This is what Greg mentioned earlier, this importance of knowing that you are supported by the people around you and by caring adults. And you know, if Mr. Rogers' neighborhood was anything, it was an expression of that lesson over and over again. Yes, things are going to be scary. Yes, things are gonna be hard, but with the support of people who love you, almost nothing is impossible. Yeah, we can't underline enough, um, Dr. Lee James, and you know this so well, the role of deep and caring relationships 
right? And it was Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. It wasn't Mr. Rogers' classroom. It was a neighborhood filled with all sorts of grown-ups in children's lives. And it, and it wasn't just the role of deep and caring relationships, but it was then deep and caring relationships that made it okay to think big things and made it okay to have big feelings. And adults who didn't rush to answer questions, right? Kids have all sorts of questions, sometimes incredibly mundane questions, somehow, sometimes incredibly profound questions. And the importance of those adults in that setting say, you know, acknowledging, respecting the big, great big questions that kids have, not rushing to answer those, but say, you know, let's think about that. Let's explore that together. Let's notice something about that question and then let's wonder where it takes us. And really creating that supportive environment where that can happen. And or, right, kids, young kids, older kids, teenagers, they notice the things that light up the passions that have been interests of adults. And, um, and so also in that environment, what is it that we are doing, that we're expressing our joy, where our joy in that vortex that Ryan described is picked up by others. We cite some very personal examples, and I'll give you a very personal example in the course of the pandemic. I'd be embarrassed for all of you to see my garage right now. It's somehow in the course of the pandemic, it's just, it's become like hoarders. But I mentioned my garage because one day last spring- Too many Amazon orders. Oh, <laughs> uh, or, or lack of cleaning or something. <laughs> but, but so I was out in the garage. I found my old skateboard. I used to skateboard as a, as a, as a kid, right? And I love skateboarding. And I pulled out my skateboard and admittedly, I didn't put on my helmet right away. I just got on the skateboard. I went down the street and then my street has a, a grade. And so I just was going down the, the road and I just was laughing hysterically, right? Like it just, the joy rushed back. I mentioned that story to say here today, a year later, eight girls on my street, all skateboard. Now, I can't draw a direct line from A to B, but I can assure you that it was also in the context of an environment where they know me, ideally I'm a trusting, loving person in their lives, whether I'm their dad or the neighbor. And they saw me doing something that I found joy in and they said, hmm, I wanna experiment with that. I wanna play with that, right? And that can happen in our own kitchens. It can happen you know, when you pull out your old guitar, it can happen as you start writing a book. Um, and it's that supportive environment where we allow ourselves to wonder together with kids and, and allow for that wonder and struggle, struggle to happen continuously. And I would, I would also just add, Ryan, that, um, you know, the wind in that scene I just described, the sort of chaos that happens in the classroom when H.J. Elephant is about to take off, that could be read, I think, in many ways as, as trauma, you know, as the chaos uh, that sur surrounds many kids throughout childhood. I don't need to tell, I'm sure many of your audience know that trauma can be widespread, that adverse childhood experiences are incredibly common. Um, what we do highlight in the book is that one of the best ways kids can bounce back from trauma, kids can bounce back from adverse childhood experiences are positive relationships. The more positive relationships you have with adults, you know, the more exposed to routines you are, the more that you feel that you belong to a community who cares about you, the more resilient you become. And uh, Rogers gives us example after example of that. Yeah, that that's that's great. I, I want to read this too because I wrote it out or I typed it out from the text. Um, speaking about the little girl who was not feeling so excited about this this magic trick that kept happening. Um, you guys write this time with the support of her friends. She's not scared. On the contrary, she feels safe. She feels steadied, and now she's ready to learn. And, and again, I think, I think for us at the speech school and the Rollins Center, that line is so powerful because it speaks to what kids need most. And after this almost two years of disrupted learning, kids are gonna come back to the classroom in the fall and it's gonna look very different. You know, what, what, what position will teachers be in? What position will families be in? How will our students feel? My daughter, who's a kindergartner actually, or a pre k -er here at the speech school who's going to kindergarten, she, after the, when the pandemic first happened, she was at home for about, I think, three, four, five months. 
when we came back, she was like chatty Kathy. She just couldn't stop talking because she was so happy to be back. But the classroom and her peers, everything was different, right? And it's really going to be that way in the fall. Um, and I want to ask another question about that. So the past year and a half has been really tough, tough for families, tough for teachers. Um, and I know that there are many teachers and parents who feel like they have failed or have fallen um, in providing their students and children with what they need. So what do you think Fred Rogers message would be to those teachers and families as they gear up to brave what is sure to be a difficult year ahead? Well, I think both Ryan and I would, um, it's, it, we would never presume to know what Fred Rogers would say or do. But I think we can also confidently say that Fred Rogers would remind each of us that he's proud of us, that um, for whatever mistakes, whatever failures, whatever we have felt, and I have felt that personally myself as a dad, I felt that as a fellow employee, I felt that in so many ways during the course of the year, Fred would remind us, um, one, how proud, and two, remind us of the extraordinary things that we have done to provide for our loved ones and to provide for our communities and, um, and to be patient and to, be, to give ourselves grace, right? Because we are bringing our kids and our loved ones through some extraordinarily hard times. And, and we've probably done a lot more than we realize. And there's probably been a lot more learning than we realize. Yeah, maybe our kids have fallen behind in math or in reading, and, or maybe by traditional measures, um, we don't feel like we're stacking up just yet but there's also been so much extraordinary learning in the course of this year. And that maybe, maybe this is in fact the beginning of a, of a renaissance of learning. Maybe it's the beginning of a renaissance of wonder in our own homes because of the ways that we've spent time with our families. Maybe it's the beginning of renaissance in our early learning centers, in our schools, in our libraries, in our museums, as we rethink what's possible now on the other side of this pandemic. And I think Fred Rogers and, you know, all of us should point to those genuine possibilities, mindful of the serious trauma, the serious stress, right? We're not painting the, the hardness out of the canvas, but we're not gonna let it destroy this renaissance of wonder um, that we have an opportunity to embrace. Yeah, I also think that, you know, I think the best gift that Fred Rogers gave us was the gift of listening and listening in a very specific way. Fred Rogers allowed us to bring feelings to him without judgment. And I think that is our charge as adults. How do, we, how do we make space for the big feelings that kids have, even if we don't understand those feelings, even if we don't disagree with those feelings? I think when kids come back to school, I, I get the concerns about learning loss, that's all very real. But I think probably the most important thing we need to do is make sure that children feel heard, make sure that they know their feelings, whatever they are, are okay and make sure that they know that the, um, the adults around them are here for them, regardless of what those feelings are, and that we're gonna give them a safe place um, for wonder and joy, like Greg mentioned. Dr. Lee James, I'm wondering if I can share a personal story because it speaks to your last two questions. It, it, it sort of Please. speaks. It, so um, I will tell you, Ryan and I have been challenged personally by this book, right? There's a hazard of, of researching and writing a book like this as we have over the last three years. And I think it's fundamentally changed us as humans. Greg, yeah. you're just rolling with my question. So keep going, <laughs> let it rip. Yeah, so it's, it's just changed me as a human being. And I, so um, just about two months ago, uh, I can tell the story now without crying, but it was the end of a hard week and it was Friday night, I was exhausted. And Ryan, I wanted to do nothing more than just throw myself on the floor and flip the TV remote among three NCAA March Madness basketball games. Like I it was just, I just needed that, that time. I was desperate for that time. My wife and my younger daughter were upstairs. They had gone to bed. My older daughter was lying on the sofa behind me. And I'm just sitting there flipping, you know, nonchalantly watching. And all of a sudden in my right ear, I hear my daughter say, daddy, am I gonna be shot? Now, there are families across this country who have heard that question before. 
there are many lucky ones among us who will never hear that question. For my daughter, who is of mixed race and is, begin, uh, is of an age that she's developing an identity, the, um, you know, the hard world of the, of the shootings of Asian Americans in Atlanta had come into my household in Pittsburgh on that Friday night. And my daughter was scared. And in a moment that I wasn't anticipating and for which I was not prepared, asked me a question that froze my heart. And it was like the blueprints of this book came home to me. And I thought, what do I, what do I do? Like, first of all, I have to acknowledge the question. I have to acknowledge that she just said something. I have to tell her that it's okay that she feels scared. Simultaneously, I have to convey to her both physical and psychological safety. Like, you're gonna be okay, honey. We're, you're going to be okay. I had to acknowledge that I didn't have the answers, that we were gonna wonder about this together, that it was okay to talk about it, that it, it's okay to have big feelings about it. Um, and I don't know, Ryan, how I did in that moment, but the instructions of that Fred method came home to me and it speaks to the personal challenges in different ways in big and small. All of us have faced over these past 60 months, but it's also the challenges as we look to that classroom in the fall or that library in the fall or whatever setting of learning as a parent or as a caring adult, as a caring professional we get to be. And it just reminds us of the importance of genuinely loving our kids letting them know that they're loved and capable of loving, letting them know that their big questions are okay, that as Fred Rogers said, what is mentionable is manageable. And if we can create those settings in our homes, in our neighborhoods and in our schools, then we'll, we'll embrace the renaissance of wonder and, and really start to do for our kids what we need to do to them and, and do it fiercely and powerfully. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Um, that, you know, as I mean, that's a person, that's a, a, I don't even know what to say. I'm just appreciative of you sharing that because I feel like at a time like this, when so many parents are faced with answering very, very tough questions, I'm just so grateful. My child is still very young, both of my kids. So I, I don't, I'm not in that space yet where I have to to answer those tough questions, but I'm really grateful for you sharing that because I feel like I'm gonna take your comment as really a charge here that we need a renaissance of early learning, of the family, of the community, because that is really the only way that our kids are going to be able to succeed. And so sometimes things happen that sort of wreck you, wreck your family, wreck your society. So it is an opportunity to build back and to build back stronger. I, I, can, I can speak on behalf of, of the Rollins Center. We certainly view this moment as that for education, that we know that the science of early brain development, social emotional development, science of language and reading has not been applied across the board, especially for communities who have had generational lack of access. And so this is really a moment for that renaissance. So I'm so grateful that you that you shared that. Um, we have, we had a few more minutes. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask another question then just thinking about families. We talked a little bit about teachers. What are, what are two or three things I think that families can do during this time. So kids are getting ready to go back to school. Arguably, it's been tough. Families been at home with their kids for a while, that's tough. Also, kids are experiencing, little kids, big kids are experiencing some social isolation, been away from their peers. What are a few things that families can do to prepare their kids um, as they go back to school? Well, in, so we complete each chapter um, with, um, it's not parenting for dummies because we wouldn't project ourselves as perfect parents, far from it, right? <laughs> but it's more sort of, what might you do based on the, what we've learned from Fred Rogers and the blueprints that he's left for us? And we give some very concrete examples that we've curated in the course of our research and our interviews. 
one of them was shared to us by Hedda Sherapin. Hedda worked with Fred Rogers from day one of his production for more than 40 years and is a remarkable educator in and of herself. And she comments about having visited a classroom. And I can't recall if it was an early childhood classroom or, or slightly older, but the teacher had in the, in the front of her classroom what she called an, an ask it basket. And I love this idea of an ask it basket because it's something you and I could do in our own homes, right? So kids have a million questions, which is fantastic, right? And you know, in the context of a classroom, the teacher is like, like, I got to do some things. I also have some mandates and challenges. But this was a teacher who created an environment that said, okay, you know, I'm going to write down this question. You've asked this incredible question. You know, maybe it came from right out over the left field wall, but I'm going to acknowledge the question. I'm going to write it down. And then I'm going to put it in the ask it basket. And at some point later, together, we're going to wonder about that. That's like a concrete thing we could all do in our, so in our, in our homes, our apartments this summer create an ask it basket. And at those moments, a quieter moment before bedtime at night or on that rainy afternoon, pull out those questions and say, oh, let's go explore the answer to this one. Or, you know, we cite the example of, of Saturday experiments. Um, there are all sorts of things that we wonder about, like, well, that's interesting, the neighbors have a garden or there's a pond down there, but I've never skipped stones, right? Like just very purposely and deliberately creating those moments when we experiment with things that are completely unknown to us, unfamiliar to us, not part of our regular habit uh, and, and finding ways to build that into the day and, and you know, even scheduling it into your iPhone if you need to, but like building those spaces. So those are just two examples of concrete things that we try and share, again, that we've curated from others as examples of very personal things that each of us can do, again, in our home, in our own home, on our own classroom. So uh, I'll just share one quick study that we cited in the book, because I think everything Greg just mentioned is an expression in its own way of, of what this study discovered. So back in the 1980s, there was uh, some researchers at the University of Washington launched a study of about 800 elementary school kids. And they split the kids into two groups. The parents and teachers of one group got um, help building stronger relationships with the kids. The parents and teachers of the other group didn't get any extra intervention. This was the control group. 30 years later, in 2019, researchers followed up with these two groups of kids to see what happened. And they found that the group whose parents and teachers had got, gotten help building relationships, these kids had outperformed their peers on everything. They were making more money. They were more physic or more healthy physically. They were more likely to be involved in their communities. They were happier. Overall, they were more satisfied with life. And this held true across race, across gender, and across class. And the researchers boiled all of this down to a very simple statement. They said, be present with your kids. When you're with them, give them opportunities for positive social involvement with you. Play with them every day. Hold them every day. You know, don't just sit on your phone when you're with them. Make, make, give them opportunities to feel bonded to you. And I think everything Greg just said is, like I said, an expression of that, of being present, um, of giving kids opportunities to know that they matter deeply to the people who matter to them. Thank you for sharing, Thank you for sharing that, Ryan. Um, it's interesting how I think either you or Greg said it at the beginning that Mr. Rogers was so far ahead of its time that there were some things that had not been discovered scientifically or had not been published yet in academic journals or anywhere for, for people to really access. But some of these things he was able to just know intuitively and brought them to Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Um, I'm thinking about the conversations that, that are taking place that we're having right now. I know that, um, that Joanne Rogers was a part sort of of this process, right? And I'm wondering, um, I guess, how do I ask this? I'm thinking about her involvement in the text and the blueprint that she says that her husband left. You talked a little bit about it at the beginning. How can we I don't want to say in this moment because we've sort of discussed that, but I'm just thinking about anything in the blueprint that we haven't discussed so far. So we've talked about social emotional 
and I know it's really, the text is really grounded in this, but even ideas around communication that we haven't touched specifically on during this conversation that might be of real benefit um, for our audience to, to be able to take back and implement. So I love that question and I love that um, Ralph Smith um, honored Joanne in his opening by noting that she was an advocate for children in her own right. And we had the complete joy of getting to know Joanne over this past decade and um, went to her before this was even a book proposal idea three years ago. And she was a champion for this project from day one. And among other things, Joanne reminded us then and she reminded us in the forward you know, she notes that, um, that Fred Rogers wasn't a saint, right? And so as we think about Fred Rogers, as we think about his legacy, and as we think about his blueprints, we have to remember how accessible this is to each of us um, as parents, as teachers, regardless of our level of knowledge about the learning science or education theory, that his blueprints are incredibly accessible and he made them accessible to us. And she also reminds us that no one worked harder at being Fred Rogers than Fred Rogers, which is a reminder to each of us that the, the work that we do is practiced. The environment that we create is practiced. The approach to our days, to our instruction is practiced. And, um, and that to me is an incredible reminder about how accessible these blueprints are. If we ourselves are intentional and deliberate and thoughtful about it, the way that Fred Rogers was. And, and, and I love that she wrote, and she says like, I hope I don't take away his aura, but he practiced, he worked hard at being Mr. Rogers. And that's who he actually was. It wasn't a character, it was Fred Rogers. And, and I think that would be Joanne's call to us. It would certainly be Fred's call to us like, be the most amazing Ryan Lee James you can be. Be your authentic, genuine self. Um, and I think if we as grown-ups take time to practice that and to be thoughtful and deliberate about what we do, um, I think Joanne would be extraordinarily proud of us taking these blueprints forward. I keep thinking, um, Ryan, about that word you use, um, a, a charge. You know, you've taken on a charge. And I think knowing that no one worked harder at being Fred Rogers than Fred Rogers is, that's a challenge and it's a charge to all of us. Like if, Red, if Fred could do it and if he gave us the blueprints to do it, then we have a responsibility to do it. I think one thing that, you know, one way this book has changed me is I used to assume that being a good person is something that you are or you're not, you know? It's easy to assume that you're a good person. It's easy to assume you're a good educator. What I realized in studying Rogers and in listening to Joanne was that, as Greg said, being good at whatever it is that you're doing, whether it's teaching or parenting or just being a human being is a practice. It's a daily practice. How do you get up in the morning? How do you decide to look at yourself? How do you, how do you decide to listen to the people around you? How do you be a neighbor? What does it mean to call yourself a neighbor? These are questions that um, I think are both important to ask yourself, but also, you know, figuring out the answers is a life's work. And Fred used to say, figuring out the truth about yourself takes a lifetime's worth of effort, but it's always worth it. And um, I hope that Greg and I are learning along the way that, yeah, it's definitely been worth it to, to look at the, the very high bar that Rogers left us, um, but also to strive for it because we know he, he worked at it every single day. Yeah, Ryan, I'm, I'm just looking back down at, um, at the quote that you guys have in the book, that life is more about striving than attaining. And so what you just said really, really speaks to that point. Um, I know that we, that we are at eight o'clock. I do want to um, just ask you both uh, and thank you both for being with us. This has been really exciting, a great conversation. And we're certainly um, at the Rollins Center and the speech school on behalf of all of us here. We're so thankful that you guys chose to spend your evening with us. Uh, but before we close, I, I would like to give you the opportunity to share anything else that I didn't ask or that didn't come up as, as a part of the discussion that you feel really needs to be, to be said or shared. 
Well, more than anything, I, I think we want to make sure that we say thank you, right? We are incredibly grateful for you, for these questions, for this time that we've had together and, and the invitation from um, the Atlanta Speech School to be part of this community tonight. So one, we have incredible gratitude. And two, um, I hope that folks, um, you know, might turn to this book as we all refuel for what's ahead there really is a remarkable opportunity in our neighborhoods and across this country for a renaissance of learning. And I'm hopeful that Ryan, we take that charge you put before us tonight. And if this book is a small part of each of us refueling and refueling our schools and our early learning centers and all of the sites of learning, um, then that's what this book is all about ultimately. Yes, it's a book about Fred Rogers and about a celebration of learning, but it's about a learning landscape that we wanna create and that we need to create for our kids, every single last one of them, as we look to our future. And if we do that, um, we'll do something special for this future generation. Yeah, um, I first just wanna echo Greg's gratitude. This, thank you so much for this conversation, Ryan. You're, you are a really good moderator. Ralph set the expectations high. <laughs> Um, but I also want to go back to the three words that Ralph mentioned at the beginning. He talked about Rogers, his authenticity, his empathy, and his grace. And I guess if, if I want parents or educators or any reader to take anything from this book, it's that we, didn't, we never set out to write an instruction manual. Um, Rogers' method was never do more of what I do or be more like me. It was always, how can you be fully yourself. And when we talk about his blueprints, we're talking about methods that anybody can pick up, duplicate, replicate, adapt, you know, adjust or discard in ways that feel authentic and relevant to them. I, I think if Rogers wanted anything for all of us, it, it, it was to express ourselves in ways that feel right and to celebrate that and to help um, kids do the same. Thank you guys. Thank you both for that. And again, we're grateful to have you here. I want to just, I'm just going to read off some words that I've heard you say over and over again through this, because I think it's a good way to close us out. Um, deliberateness, intentional and intentionality, thoughtful, practiced, empathy, and a, a one-liner, if it's mentionable, it's manageable. Um, and I just wanna just wanna end with that because I think, um, I know because I'm in a school right now that all of us are gonna be laser focused on those things that you mentioned, Greg and Ryan. The, the learning loss with reading, the learning loss with math, the learning loss in science. And this learning loss, right, has been experienced across the board. Yes, there are people who have, who have been disproportionately impacted, but it's certainly across the board. But what I've heard you say through this discussion, um, and again, not just on your, on your own um, knowledge, but what the science tells us is that we have to start with relationships, that we have to get, when we get back in the classroom, it's got to be about establishing relationships of safety, trust, care, and being intentional with our students because that's the only way, right, that any sort of learning is going to be able to happen. And so I hope that um, that, that message is, is going to be echoed tonight for everyone who's listening because I know, um, again, firsthand from being in a school, we're so terrified about the academic loss that we have not there has not been enough focus around the support that students, that teachers, and that families are going to need as we, you know, work our way back into a very new normal. So Ryan and Greg, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Um, we really appreciate it. Greg Bear, Ryan Rizeski, authors of um, When You Wonder, You're Learning. Thank you thank so you much, Ryan. Thank, thank you both. Thank you so much. Start with love. <laughs>